Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Triple N Media. I am Dr. Nick Nickham, a cardiologist who has been in practice for more than 40 years in Houston, Texas. And this is a series of lectures on your heart. The focus of today's presentation is how do we evaluate a patient presenting with chest pain for the first time? This question was triggered by a meeting I attended this evening where I was talking to a 40-year-old young IT executive who said, I am occasionally getting chest pain. What is the process? How do you evaluate a person with uh, chest pain? So let me walk you through a complete scenario of how we evaluate a patient with chest pain in our office. A little bit basic foundation about chest pain. Not all chest pain is related to the heart, which is namely the coronary artery disease that causes the blockage in the arteries that leads to chest pain, heart attack, heart failure, arrhythmias, and the whole story that goes with it. Over 50% of the time, when patients present with chest pain, it happens to be non-cardiac. Even when patients are admitted with the questionable chest pains in the hospital, they go through electrocardiograms and preliminary blood tests and all these things. And still, when they go for a heart catheterization, more than 50% of them have normal coronary arteries. So there is a good chance the pain you're having may not be cardiac. But it is not something that you want to ignore. The chest pain can be coming from your chest wall. It could be coming from the rig cavity. It could be related to pleurisy. It could be related to acid reflux. It could be related to esophageal spasm, a whole number of things. Or it could be related to the pericardial sheath covering the heart. It could be related to just anxiety. It could be related to muscular pains. So there are a number of things that can cause chest pain besides coronary artery disease. But there are some other conditions like heart valve condition, namely aortic stenosis, that can give rise to chest pain or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can give rise to chest pain. And it is our job as cardiologists to find out precisely what is causing your chest pain and we have all the necessary tools and equipment to diagnose this in an office setting. So if you come to the office for the first time, you of course, you complete your paperwork, you complete a history sheet that is given to you along with your insurance cards, of course, that goes without saying. Then we sit down and talk to you in detail, take your medical history, your family history, your past history, your medications, your allergies, your hospitalizations, and all these things are put into our electronic record. Then we do a risk assessment. What is your chances of having a heart problem to begin with before we do any tests? Do you have a history of hypertension? Do you have diabetes? Do you have high cholesterol? Do you smoke? Do you have a family history of heart disease? All these are major risk factors. The more risk factors we have, you have, the chances are higher that your chest pain is cardiac. If you have multiple risk factors, then you definitely need to be evaluated for coronary artery disease before we look for anything else. Once we have obtained this risk factor assessment and family history, we do a thorough clinical examination. It may seem like, you know, the doctor put the stethoscope for one second and he walked out, he charged me $500. No, it is not like that. Most of the cardiologists have spent 20 years or plus in the field of cardiology and when they are watching you from the time you walk in, they are watching you every minute they are talking to you. So we are absorbing a lot of things as we sit and talk face to face. Then we look for any evidence of venous distension, any evidence of fluid collection, any evidence of irregular heart murmurs, any evidence of rubs, 
and we listen to the lungs to see anything that may be a clue that the pain may be coming from your lungs. So there are a lot of things we do which may look like nothing is happening, but believe me, we are doing constantly something because when we are sitting in the room trying to diagnose your chest pain, our brain is working like a computer, checking off some of the things that may not be related to your symptomatology and trying to find out trying to narrow down the diagnosis. We also listen to your heart for murmurs. As I said, some people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have chest pain. Patients with aortic stenosis can have chest pain. Patients with pericarditis who may have like a pericardial rub, like a rub that we can hear. So all these clues tell us what direction we are going. So once we finish the physical examination, so we have more additional information to that we add some tests. The tests could include blood tests. The blood tests are going to be drawn in the lab or in the office itself, which will be checking for CBC, kidney function, liver function, lipid profiles, prostate, if you are a man, and tests for diabetes, hemoglobin A1C, magnesium, electrolytes. We check all these things because as cardiologists, we are not just focused on your coronary arteries. We are focused on your entire human being as a person. And we check all the systems to make sure that the other systems are not interacting with the heart or creating symptoms that may mimic heart disease. Remember, a gallbladder pain can mimic as a heart attack or a heart attack can mimic as a gallbladder pain. So it takes a cardiologist to differentiate these two. We have seen people who have gone for gallbladder surgery and come outside of the operating room to know, find out they had a heart attack. Yes, indeed, I have seen this one. Okay, let's continue. We do the blood test to look for cholesterol levels because that's the number one risk factor for heart disease. The next thing we do is an electrocardiogram. And here is uh, drawing blood, which is most of you had the experience. Uh, you, you may just feel a little tinge and after that, uh, the blood is drawn, you won't feel anything and that should be done about 10 minutes at the most. Uh, then we do the electrocardiogram. And incidentally, these leads are not properly placed as, an electro, uh, as a heart specialist, I can tell you the lead positions are inaccurate. Anyway, we do a 12 lead electrocardiogram. The just resting electrocardiogram will tell us a lot of information about your heart, where it has been, where it is today, follow? If you had an enlargement of the heart, it will show up. If you had a previous heart attack, the electrocardiogram will show up. If you are having an irregular heart rhythm, it will show up. If you are having extra beats, the EKG will show up. So the EKG tells us a lot of information. If your heart is having strain from high blood pressure, the EKG may show these changes. And when, the, when we see these changes, the approach that we are going to take next may be different than if you had a completely normal electrocardiogram. A complete normal electrocardiogram doesn't rule out chest pain coming from the heart. But if it's normal, it's good because we have a good starting baseline. So that is a good starting point. And once we have obtained an electrocardiogram, that is not enough to say whether your chest pain is coming from your heart or whether it's coming from elsewhere. At least we know you, you didn't have an acute heart attack. At least we know you're not having a significant strain on your heart muscle at the present time, but we need to do further studies. The next step would be to do an echocardiogram. As you can see, here's an echocardiogram machine. We put a Doppler here and we get ultrasound images like this. Here's the cross section of the heart. Uh, you can follow my arrow here. And here's the Doppler looking at the blood flow. We can look at the heart size, the heart thickness, fluid around the heart, the heart valves, the heart wire function, any blood leak, in the enlargement of the heart chamber, a whole host of things we can collect the information. We can also rule out any evidence of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We can rule out aortic stenosis. These are the conditions that can also cause chest pains. Once we have ruled out all these conditions and still we don't have an answer, the next step would be a stress test. Of course, a normal stress test would be extremely useful. It is 97% accurate in men to rule out coronary artery disease. 
So in other words, you take a 40-year-old person with no major risk factors, with normal cholesterol level, we put them on a treadmill, and if the treadmill is normal, that should be it. Your chest pain is mostly non-cardiac, it could be stress, it could be related to anxiety, it could be related to chest wall pain, or it could be an acid reflux, so let us look for your chest pain elsewhere. We can reassure the patient, but that is not the end of it. In the follow-up, I'll tell you exactly what we need to do because uh, that is important whether you have coronary artery disease or not. In female patients, the regular treadmill is not reliable. We get 50 to 60% false positive tests. That means even though they don't have a blockages, their stress test may be abnormal. So generally, I do not recommend a regular treadmill test in a female patient. We can do a, a more imaging technique such as a nuclear stress test like a chemical stress test if the person cannot exercise. We can do a chemical injection to improve the blood circulation to the heart muscle and look at this myocardial perfusion or blood flow through the heart muscle and see if there are any areas of deficit. Like here, there's a decrease in the uptake of the isotope compared to this region. And that may suggest this area is not getting adequate blood supply. That's how we determine if there is a, a compromised circulation to any regions, any region of the heart muscle by using the nuclear imaging. There are other more sophisticated images like PET scan or CT scan or MRA that can be used to refine these techniques to see this, but rarely do we ever need those kind of tests. We, if the nuclear stress is normal, then most likely your chest pain is not cardiac. On the other hand, if the nuclear stress is abnormal, the next step would be to do a cardiac catheterization. So this is like an operating room, but it is not. Uh, here we, we bring the patient, we dress them with the drapes, the patient is alert, we give them something to sort of sedate, a small uh, uh, needle is put in the groin or in the arm and catheters are passed here and angiograms are obtained like this. And as you can see, there's a critical blockage here in the middle of the artery where the arrow is. And this can be opened up with a stent instead of going for surgery. And I'm just walking you through an entire sequence, but most people don't even reach this stage. They may be just done with the regular treadmill test or at the most a nuclear stress test. This is in, in an advanced case patient who has history of coronary artery disease to start with or who has multiple risk factors and typical exertion related chest pain and EKG changes and those are the patients who may manifest like this and if this is a situation and if we find a critical blockage in an artery supplying the heart muscle we open up that blockage with a balloon first and then a stent is placed to widen the lumen so that we can improve the blood circulation to the heart. So this is in a nutshell, starting with your registration form, completing the history, completing the risk factors, completing the family history, physical examination, blood test, EKG, echocardiogram, and a regular stress test. That's where we most of the time stop and in rare cases, as I said, maybe very small percentage where may, we may end up doing heart catheterization and the stent if necessary. But that is just the beginning of a whole new journey in your life if you're diagnosed to have the chest pain coming from the heart due to a blockage in your artery. If that is the case, then you and your doctor need to get serious. This is a life-transforming visit. The risk factors have to be drastically modified. That means you have to adapt a whole new lifestyle of reduced carbohydrate intake, reduced calorie intake, reduced fat intake, reduced cholesterol level, reduce your blood sugar level, bring your blood pressure down, reduce your weight, and reduce your stress, get on a regular exercise program, take the medications as religiously as possible and follow up with your doctors on a regular basis. So that is the, the lifelong recommendation which has to be followed no matter whether you have a small blockage, 
or whether you have multiple blockages. And finally, I say no smoking, drinking and cursing. Whenever I say this, my patients say, why not cursing? Cursing helps me. I say, no. Every time you stress, your epinephrine level goes up. It increases your heart rate. It increases your heart demand and it put more strain on your heart. You need to learn to relax. You need to learn meditation. You need to learn a whole new lifestyle modification to stay healthy and be productive and enjoy your life in spite of having heart disease. My chance, the chances are that you don't have a heart disease. This was a warning signal and still I would suggest even if this is a warning signal, if you have a family history of heart disease or you have one or two risk factors, I would suggest jump on this bandwagon and get your life under control so that you can prevent the rapid development of uh, heart disease in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this has been useful to you. This was done as a dedication to my friend who asked me a simple question. I'm occasionally feeling a little chest pain and what should I do? What do you all do to find out what is causing this chest pain? I hope I have answered the question. There are many, many educational videos for the general public on the topic of cardiology. If you want me to prepare a presentation on any particular topic, please let me know. I will do the research. I will find out the information and present to you in a manner that you and your family can understand. Thank you so much for your time.